Okay, so let's go to your uh, <coughs> sheet here. Okay, we're looking at this, all right? So we were trying to distinguish between uh, these kinds of models, which you're all familiar with, based on forecasts and the arbitrage-free valuation models. Okay, which uh, so what we are trying. So the main thing. So let's understand first uh, the uh, key feature of arbitrage-free valuation uh, models, and their I mean this approach to valuation. Both of these are approaches to fair value. Both of these are approaches to finding out the fair value, but they are fundamentally different because in these approaches, the uh, exogenous variables are at least some of them are forecasts okay so that's why I'm calling it forecast based valuation but here you will notice in uh, AFV there there is no forecast involved right what we saw yesterday okay so uh, let's just look at let's try and put some uh, definitions on that mainly to understand um, yeah so I put the notes here in your uh, in your session outline later on I'll create a separate note uh, just topic wise on valuation okay so we have have already so this is there right now in your notes for today right so uh, this part you're already familiar with value versus price based comparison based analysis which we discussed yesterday these frameworks okay so in general what we say is all valuation is subjective and price is objective is this clear yes. okay but there is one type of valuation which is not subjective which is what you saw yesterday okay I'm trying to figure out the uh, sheet where we had that which is the sheet where we noted down this um, I think is it below here itself or so I think I did it in this sheet uncovered and covered interest rate arbitrage okay uh, uncovered and covered uh, interest arbitrage okay so this is where we wrote it down okay so the example that we discussed yesterday okay so what we were discussing is what is the uh, so, so the approach to so when you look at a market price here you're trying to figure out whether you should buy or sell okay and uh, one of the ways you can do it if you don't believe in ta all right one of the ways you actually arbitrage free valuation will apply even if you believe in ta this is the exception because as you will see arbitrage free valuation is 100 percent objective so even if you believe in ta if you see a, a uh, you know proper uh, a case of true arbitrage free valuation like what we discussed yesterday if you are able to see such an opportunity in the market even if you believe in ta you should grab it because this is free money this is just a surefire thing there's no market risk you should just grab it okay so this has nothing to do with the belief in ta so this is the one exception so that's why i've said that um all valuation is subjective, price is there, but the only exception is what we call AFV properly so called, which is written in your, uh, this, this terminology is taken from an English jurist called John Austin, who referred to laws properly so called and improperly so called. So I've just tried to use that, but you can just think about what is true AFV or not true AFV. Okay. So this is AFV, what you saw yesterday, that is not subjective. And why do we say that? Because as you can see here, there's nothing subjective about it because you can see the price prices you your your estimate of the fair value of North Delhi sugar was 45 because you could see for 45 rupees you could create a synthetic equivalent for uh, the uh, not the natural sugar being traded in the North Delhi market directly but you could clear us create a synthetic equivalent for 45 rupees by buying it in South Delhi and transporting it to North Delhi this is clear okay so this is really the heart of arbitrage free valuation if you want to understand arbitrage free valuation and first we are trying to understand what true a AFV is later on we'll see why option models are not true AFV okay and so the heart of this is basically two words synthetic equivalent you remember synthetic equivalent yes, from sir. options yes, okay sir. so the idea is always when you see something like you see a call option being traded in the marketplace the call option has a certain price yeah you look at a model like this you find that a call option has one price okay uh, but and then you can think about a synthetic equivalent which is now what are you doing in the case of synthetic equivalent you're essentially saying okay can I uh, replicate the payoff of this call option can I replicate the payoff by using some combination long short of other instruments right 
okay that is the idea behind the synthetic equivalent okay i'm going to replicate the payoff okay but i'll be not you i will not be using the call i'll be using some other combination of instrument long shot underlying asset call port whatever i mean put but not calls okay so is this clear the idea of the synthetic equivalent okay so then what you do is here so as a call option what will be the synthetic equivalent of the long call if we do some revision long underlying and short put long underlying and short put anybody else with a different view long put a long stock and so he is actually correct okay so you said short put he is actually saying long put long put is the correct answer not short put because think of it on either side of the price okay so if you want to replicate the payoff of a long call okay you need the as the price market rises above the strike price you need the uh, payoff to be linearly increasing okay proportionately okay so that will come from taking a long underlying position because there also the uh, market your profit will position will show profit as soon uh, in proportion to the rise in the market price okay but the problem with the long you start with the first step long underlying but the problem now with the long underlying is on the downside as the market drops the long underlying shows a linear loss profile that you don't want you want the losses to be cut off okay at some point okay so that will come from long put so what will happen is that the long put will make a, a long put also will make your proportional profits as the market price falls and that will offset the losses on the underlying cap on the long underlying yeah you go back to your uh, to your hull uh, textbook and see those things we have already done this in options okay so the idea Idea behind the long put is that it will completely upset because as the market declines, the long put makes money proportionately, and that money will offset the losses on the long underlying. So together, the long underlying and the long put create the same payoff profile as the long call. And the long underlying for the long put, you'll have to pay something. Okay, you have to pay up some money because you're buying the option. You have to pay out. You have to shell out some premium. So you will see a part which is below the zero line. that is the cost of your put option is this clear right so that's what you're saying so now what you will say is that whatever it costs me so you will say now what is the fair value of this call option the fair value of this call option is whatever it costs me to create the synthetic equivalent of the call option are you following the logic of the synthetic equivalent and how it is used to arrive at fair values okay so once again this would again be a case of true afv because if assuming the underlying and the put option are freely traded you can see their prices in the markets okay in fact if you read the if you look at the go back to your relevant sections of the option notes okay uh if you see the i refer to certain parts of the natenberg book okay the sheldon natenberg book on option volatility he has given some very good examples of how you can make money if the prices are out of line okay so once again this is an example of true afv because you are deciding you are arriving at the so the heart of afv approaches to valuation is basically this synthetic equivalent so you always will think of creating to find out the fair value of something x you will always think about okay can i create a synthetic equivalent of x without using x can i create the payoff profile which is the same as x by using some combination of other instruments long short okay which will have the same payoff profile of x then that will become the synthetic equivalent of x and so the thinking is whatever it costs you to create the synthetic equivalent that alone should be the fair value of x because if it moves away from there then there will be an opportunity to make a risk free profit just like you saw in this example where the north delhi sugar price has moved away from its afv uh, from its fair value determined using afv true afv principles okay you can see that the fair value of the synthetic is actually the the cost of generating the synthetic equivalent is only 45 rupees so the market price is uh, out of line with the fair value and in this case because the market price is higher than the fair value we will buy here we will buy the synthetic equivalent and we will sell the higher price one so we'll make a risk free profit okay this is clear so understand the idea behind risk, uh, the arbitra afv principles of valuation is it 
always involves a synthetic equivalent. You always think in those along those lines. Okay. So now the other thing that we said is obviously this is a case of true AFV, therefore it's not subjective. So now you understand first in the first place why I have made a distinction and made it a different approach to valuation compared to this, because here your inputs are subjective because they are forecasts. Okay, so different people will come up with different values. That's why when you look at equity analysts being discussed, if you're watching other programs like Bloomberg Technology gives you very good coverage of technology companies. A lot of analysts come on regularly and they will discuss the valuation of Apple, the valuation of uh, WeWork and this, that. So you'll see, uh, but everybody, you, you'll see that many, most of the analysts have different views. Some people are bullish, some are bearish. Why is that happening? Here, there's no scope for different views because we know what the price in South Delhi is. We know what the transport cost is. There's no question of subjectivity. These prices are available in the market. So there's no scope for people to have different views. But in this block here, you have, uh, which is most of the fundamental analysis that goes on in the markets. This is all subjective because it's based on forecasts and different people have different forecasts. All right. So that's the, so that's the main reason I've made this distinction. Okay. So this, this particular type of valuation technique, which involves the uh, thinking along the lines of synth synthetic equipment and the cost of generating the synthetic equivalent that's your uh, fair value using AFV methods okay and why did we say we said as why is it AFV because if you do it this way if you set uh, this is an AFV fair value because if the market price is set equal to this AFV fair value then there is no opportunity to earn arbitrage profits that is it is free of opportunity free of arbitrage opportunities that's why we say arbitrage free valuation this is clear all right okay and whenever it's out of line there's an opportunity to and so essentially so the other important concept that we have to understand here is this concept of classical riskless arbitrage i put all the notes here i may reorganize a little bit okay but the other important point which actually should be understood uh, we can use this example itself as understanding classical riskless arbitrage i've got the yeah okay so the uh, we have to understand another term okay why have i used this term classical riskless arbitrage um, if you use it generally because there's a lot of misuse of this word in the industry okay there are lots of instances where people use the word arbitrage to de describe transactions which are actually not examples of classical riskless arbitrage so i've had basically people will understand when you use this term but the reason i deliberately created this term is to distinguish cra from other cases of the use of the word arbitrage which are not true arbitrage which are not really riskless okay so arbitrage basically should be riskless okay which you saw here in this example this is an example of classical riskless arbitrage because you have two different uh, you have the same uh, item the same base asset the same base asset away trading at two different prices mm -hmm. one is of course the synthetic equivalent okay because the grade of sugar is the same and you have two uh, you have the same base asset trading at two different prices okay so by trading with different counterparties two or more counterparties you can essentially lock in a riskless profit by simultaneously buying and selling so you sell the one which is overpriced okay and you buy the one which is underpriced all right so the idea we have so this idea of classical riskless arbitrage is also intimately connected to the idea of the synthetic equivalent because what are you comparing the price of the synthetic equivalent versus let's say we can call it the natural price since we are saying synthetic on one side let's call the other one the natural price so here this is the natural price or the direct price okay and the synthetic is the direct indirect or the synthetic price okay so when we are talking about classical riskless arbitrage as being simultaneous buying and selling of the same base asset in two with two different counterparties okay uh, to lock in a riskless profit okay so there you can see already in built into that is the idea of the synthetic equivalent because what you are always going to compare it to see whether there's any opportunity for cra okay i'm going to keep on just using the word cra now for classical riskless arbitrage this is such a big expression so the to see whether there's any opportunity for cra you will always first can calculate the cost of the synthetic equivalent so you will ask yourself is there a possibility to create a synthetic equivalent here and can i actually uh, execute the arbitrage that's also important as i said if the north delhi ndmc puts up barriers and says no movement of sugar sugar from south to north delhi then you're stuck 
you can oh, we can see that on in, in on paper yes we have this theoretical equivalent but since i can't actually buy in south delhi and deliver in north delhi <coughs> i can't actually force these two prices to come together okay remember in this time in this paradigm what is the view price versus value base what is the central view that eventually price must converge sooner or later price must come back converge to fair value right but the problem here is if the ndmc puts up barriers and does not allow you to move sugar from south to north there is no way to make the price converge because you can't execute the arbitrage are you following so that allows the prices to be out of line and no one can do anything about it because and so understand maybe i didn't explain the convergence also so if you think about it it will become clear what happens so uh, let's say when we see this situation okay so people start buying obviously if i see an opportunity like this why should i trade even in 100 tons i will trade like a uh, hundred million tons because it's free money okay there is no risk it's free money so i will trade in as large a size as possible okay maybe ten thousand quintals or something like that okay so what will happen is people everybody will try to basically take advantage of this opportunity so there will be massive volume of buying pressure in this market in the south delhi market are you following there will be lots of bidding people bidding for the sugar in south delhi is that clear i'm not getting a sufficiently emphatic response that's clear okay everybody will want to make this money and how do they make this money they buy in south delhi and sell it and deliver it to north delhi and they are selling in north delhi in the north delhi market they will sell and in the south delhi market they are buying is this clear and they're also bidding they're also going to be contracting for transport right because they have to move the sugar so everybody will doing be doing this in large volumes because there's free money available so i would like to do it there's no risk so i don't have to worry about position size and my risk limit and risk per trade and all that because there's free money there's no risk involved are you following okay so i want to do it and so i know i have to do i no longer have to do those complicated calculations of what is the maximum amount of sterling that i can buy on this cable trade because my entry price is this and i can't lose more than maximum of this much on a trade here there's no risk of losing money right so then i'll do it and as much so what happens so there's massive excess demand in the south delhi market what is the impact of excess demand on the price it moves up or down price will move up if there's massive excess demand in, Del in south delhi so this will start moving up okay and here there will be massive excess supply because everybody is coming and selling the same quantity here because whatever you buy here so excess supply the impact on the price is down okay so therefore this will con this will start falling and 45 will start rising and this will start falling so that will lead to convergence of prices okay it will keep on falling as, i mean the buy excess uh, you know the imbalance and the excess demand here and the excess supply here will keep on remaining will keep uh, will remain in place as long as the divergence and there's opportunity to make money right when the opportunity is wiped out then uh, in this case strictly speaking the opportunity is only wiped out when the two prices come together <laughs> this is clear so now you understand what is convergence that the price you understand what is the what are the forces that will force the prices to converge okay so this you can see here is a first hand example of this paradigm working okay remember we are in this block we are in this block here so here we always believe that why do we bother to compute a fair value because we believe that the uh, price will eventually have to converge to fair value maybe not today maybe not next week but eventually has to come down to fair value all right so therefore uh, that's what we believe and that's why we do these things that's why we do this kind of thing right that's why we do this kind of thing so now you can understand how the prices will converge when and when there is a case of true afv this is clear because this arbitrage will prove uh, will force the prices to converge okay so this is essentially what we call classical riskless arbitrage and i've defined it here it's already in your notes so we can see maybe i'll need to add some words here act of locking in an instantaneous riskless profit without a capital outlay this is how we traditionally define it so you assume that whatever is required funds whatever required funds they are borrowed and excess funds are lent out okay by simultaneously buying and selling the same asset while trading with this i should change a little to at least 
because all statements have to be correct in all circumstances you don't have to trade with only two you can trade with more than two but you'll have to trade with at least two because one guy is not going to be so stupid that <laughs> you will he will buy and sell from him at the same at the same time at two different prices right so um, all right so uh, is this clear now simultaneously selling and buying the same asset um, we can put in one more thing here that um, often using different instruments this we have to make clear like for instance what you saw we we could have done an arbitrage if the call price was out of line if the call price was out of line with the cost of going long the underlying and buying the buying the put if the call price was underlying we could have done CRA here also we could have if the call price was overpriced then let's say the call price was maybe uh, two point the synthetic uh, equivalent of the call was 2.95 and the call is priced at 3.01 in this case there are many such examples in that Nattenberg book you can read the relevant segments which are referred to so in this case we would sell the call and we would go along the underlying and we would buy the put and then we would lock in that riskless amount of profit okay so this is basically what we would do and that's why I'm saying using different instruments so here I've used three instruments actually call put and underlying all right so therefore we need to just modify this a little bit the definition by often using different instruments okay so you can understand the same base asset we can also make this uh, same base asset is being uh, uh, traded okay and uh, using different instruments while so trading with two days. So everyone understands now the concept of CRA. Another thing to remember about CRA is that when we say riskless, we only talk about this is why the taxonomy of risk becomes important again. Important again, we are only talking about the removal of market risk. It is not free. It is riskless in the sense that there, it is free of market risk, but it is not free of credit risk. It is not necessarily free of operational risk also because sometimes if you have both the guys on the phone, one phone line may suddenly instantaneously go down. <coughs> so there is something that would be an example of operational risk. When you're trying to close a deal and then your internet goes down or you're, you're trying to transact, that's why on, trade in, on trading flows, we usually have redundant internet supply from multiple ISPs. So you don't have the connections dependent on one ISP. Okay, so uh, therefore you have that is basically to cover operational risk. This would be an example of operational risk. If you're trying to do a deal and then the phone line goes down, that's like operational risk. So that can also happen when you're doing the arbitrage. But generally you go in, uh, you go in to do the arbitrage when you see that there is no market risk. Okay, you can clearly remove the market risk. Okay, so all this stuff is in your no uh, in your notes. Okay, so this is there now. Uh, yeah so while we have now so you've understood two important concepts now what is arbitrage free valuation okay that it is intimately connected to the idea of the synthetic equivalent which you've already covered before and then you've learned a new term which you see here classical riskless arbitrage that you should be able to instantaneously remove all market risk okay uh, by doing this kind of simultaneous buy sell of uh, the same uh, base asset creating the same uh, uh, payoff profile okay and we using different instruments so that's your classical riskless arbitrage now why are we coined this big term CRA because there are many terms okay so like one example of a term is merger arbitrage okay sometimes just called merger arm okay so uh, sometimes also called risk arm okay Arb arbitrage sometimes is shortened in the markets to just arm okay so buying stocks of companies that are potential targets and selling uh, let's put it this way you understand target and acquirer in MA? You understand target and acquirer? So, another big MA transaction, uh, which is very fascinating actually, which I was talking about that day, I couldn't remember the term, which is that LVMH is buying Tiffany's. Yes. Okay, that's a very big. So, if you're interested, and if you're. So, one of the things you can. Uh, if you're going to be an equity analyst, one of the areas you can. Or even a credit analyst, one of the sectors you would focus on is retail. Okay, and within, a, within retail, there will be a subclass of luxury retail okay so LVMH falls under uh, uh, both LVMH and Tiffany fall under uh, luxury retail okay LVMH you know what the full form is 
Louis Vuitton and Moe Hennessy, not Hesne, but uh, Moe Hennessy. So Moe is a champagne and Hennessy is a cognac. And Louis Vuitton, you know, is uh, the luggage and all kinds of other stuff, right? Bags, Bags and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, so Louis Vuitton is actually a very, uh, it's uh, the market cap is quite high. Actually, the head of Louis Vuitton is now the third richest person in the world uh, after Bill Gates and, um, uh, and Bezos. So he's now become the third richest. So, so there and then the stocks are also rising and Tiffany's you know you had seen this film called Breakfast at Tiffany's yes sir. Huh? it's a nice film okay very old classic film it's got a nice song also in it you can look it up Moon, the song is called Moon River it's actually sung by Audrey Hepburn in the film okay so uh, it's a very nice song so you can look it up so Tiffany's is basically a luxury uh, it's like jewelry and all those kind of things okay so uh, so these guys are buying so now what will happen what is the merger up desk gonna do they are going to sell the shares of LVMH okay and they will buy the shares of Tiffany's so you can either do this so let me just re refine the definition a little bit buying selling stocks of companies that are potential targets stroke acquirers everybody understands what I mean by writing it this way yes you understand how uh, how this is written yes buying selling so you buy the stock of the target Do you understand m a logic Yes. right that you have uh, the acquiring company generally they will have to pay with they, sometimes they pay with stock okay I'm not sure what the financing of this transaction is but uh, sometimes most of the time there'll be some debt involved okay so they will issue bonds sometimes they pay in cash but to pay that cash they issue bonds the acquiring company will issue bonds uh, to find uh, to fund that purchase and that is actually the connection between M&A and investment banking because the bond uh, raising the debt capital will become the function of the investment bank okay so uh, and people get confused because the large investment banks have M&A departments also and that doesn't mean that M&A is investment banking so uh, is this clear now merger arbitrage you have understood one kind of transaction you understood one kind of transaction merger arm this means basically you buy the stocks of the uh, acquiring company uh, you sell the stocks of the acquiring company and you uh, buy the stocks of the target company yes you can do it either before the merger is announced so when you hear rumors these guys hear rumors in the market or they do some analysis and they find out that Tiffany is not doing well then that LVMH might come in with a bid there's a high chance so you can that's very very speculative transaction okay so you can do it then or you can also do it after the merger is announced okay because before the merger is officially announced is one or before the merger is officially completed because once you announce the merger there's also a uh, time before you complete there's some uncertainty because the uh, antitrust regulators may not allow the merger to happen mm. okay so like when Lafarge and wholesome and all these mergers happen in India they had to go through the Competition Commission of India to get a clearance okay even the idea of Vodafone merger they had to get clearance from the CCI all right so there is even after you announce the merger there is some risk that the merger may not happen because the regulators might shoot it down okay like there's a lot of trouble in the US with the Time Warner AT&T Time Warner merger okay I don't know if it's still clear or not so even after the merger is announced there's some risk and there are people who bet on that so then after the merger is announced they still because what will happen is that the target price the acquisition price may not be reached so let's say they're promising to buy they have offered to buy Tiffany at let's say $115 a share but you might find even after the merger is announced the pocket is trading at say 95 because the market is not sure that the merger will be completed okay because the regulators might shoot it down and that's why it's not trading at the target price so there'll be guys who speculate even at that stage that I think this is gonna go through so let me buy it at 95 because then I can sell it at 115 are you following all this kind of activity is referred to as merger arm or risk arm okay in the markets this is not the right use of the word arbitrage okay so this is not the right use of the word arbitrage that's why I because why can you see that because there's there is always market risk because you first of all if you do it at this stage before the merger is officially announced then there's very high risk because the merger may not go through right and then the price movement will not be the way you expected okay so the price you may end up with a big loss all right so that's a risk so there is no it's not free of market risk this transaction is not free of market risk right so that's why we say that this is not CRA so this is not the right use of the word arbitrage so strictly speaking the word arbitrage should only be used when there is truly a riskless profit to be earned there is no market risk will remain on the books 
Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Sir. Okay. So the industry is not particular about the use of the word, so they use it loosely. But you can't force people not to use these words. But you should know in your mind that this is not CRA. Every time you see a misuse of the word arbitrage, you should understand that this is not CRA. Okay. That should be cleared in your mind. You should understand what CRA is, uh, and you should be clear that this is not C CRA. Okay. There's another example that I can give you. There are many examples actually. I can't think of anything else other than another thing that you can do is um, actually this is also an example of um, let me see if I have here uncovered interest arbitrage um, that is also yeah so this is also I'm just giving you um, another example okay which will be um, so uncovered interest arbitrage okay I'm just giving you some examples we're not going to explain everything also called um, um, a carry trade um, in FX markets this is called a carry trade have you heard this expression a carry trade okay so this is also an example where I'll just give you a brief idea of carry trades if you look at so this is a very famous pair carry trade that was done a lot uh, for many years but then eventually people lost a lot of money okay so if you look at so we'll just briefly understand this transaction also uncovered interest arbitrage what you're doing here is so we're just looking at a couple of examples then I'll give you one more example of a term which is which you're just going to be familiar with now this is uh, Aussie yen okay because for a long time we've had very low interest rates in the yen and up, uh, so now recently the Aussie rates have also come down in the last five six years uh, or maybe more than that but in the in the uh, in the middle there was a time when Aussie interest rates were quite high okay even after the financial crisis Aussie interest rates were quite high and yen interest rates were very very low they've been low for a long time so what people were doing is because they, they were borrowing in yen because the interest rate is very low all right they were borrowing in yen and they were uh, selling that yen so they were borrowing yen and they were selling that yen and buying australian dollars if you see the top part of this here i've looked at this is an uncovered interest rate uh, arbitrage okay where you borrow in this case let's say we have taken the example of usd okay so if the usd interest rates are low okay then you borrow at half percent in us dollars okay so when you get borrowing uh, you borrow us dollars you get some dollars in your hand there's a positive inflow when the loan is disbursed okay so then you take that dollars that you have those dollars that you have you sell it in the spot fx market and you buy aussie okay so you sell us and buy aussie in the spot fx markets and then you see the aussie interest rates are two and a half percent yes okay so here you just imagine for the chart that I'm showing you that in the just replace dollars with uh, yen okay in this case we can just write it because I don't want to make uh, changes everywhere just imagine that instead of USD you have yen so then we can relate it to the chart as well so then what you have done is you have uh, taken you have borrowed these US dollars you have borrowed these yen you have put it on deposit in Aussie dollars and you're earning a clean 2% spread right very nice good time you're having a good time but the problem here is that so this kind of thing as long as the Aussie is appreciating against the yen it's fine but if there is a movement like this okay like this is the 2007 credit crisis okay um, when you have a movement like this there's a sharp depreciation of the Aussie against the yen now this downward move is more than 2% much more than 2% so basically what's happening is the because you're taking some foreign exchange risk in this case because what you're doing is you're borrowing in yen you're borrowing in yen and you're putting it on Aussie dollar deposit. So you are, this is what is called an asset liability mismatch. Your assets are in Australian dollars and your liabilities are in yen. So as long as the Aussie yen rate does not move, you're fine. Or if the Aussie appreciates against the yen, then also you're fine. You're more than fine. But if it goes the other way, then you have a problem, right? Which many Indian uh, companies have also made this mistake especially when our interest rates were much higher they borrowed in foreign currencies like swiss franc okay and then they uh, use that money and they don't have any swiss franc revenues 
they are not earning in Swiss francs so they have to pay back those Swiss francs with the rupee earnings that they have in India right so now if the Swiss franc appreciates against the rupee dramatically can you see there's a problem yes, sir. okay because the fixed amount of the Swiss franc liability amount does not change but now when the rupee depreciates against the Swiss franc you have to shell out many more rupees to buy that one Swiss franc if per unit of Swiss franc so you suffer a loss okay is this clear so this is basically another example although we have used the word arbitrage and the market continues to use the word arbitrage uh, where this is again a not not an example of CRA if we go back to our uh, if we go up to our road okay here here so this again is not arbitrage proper arbitrage okay so we'll give this as a second example uh, important distinction CRA and other situations okay latter are not CRA so example okay if we write this as example one is merger arbitrage you understood why you understood now you've learned this you understood why merger arbitrage is not your first you understood what merger arbitrage is right all right now you've also understood uh, why merger arb is not CRA right so therefore you understand why I'm saying that merger arb is not a proper use of the term arbitrage okay all right, so Garvid still has not learned this lesson. <laughs> you have. Please come back on time. Okay. So first transaction you learned about is merger arbitrage, also called risk arb. Second transaction you learned about. So we are now just giving examples of transactions where we improperly in the industry. You can't stop people in industry from using these terms. So you have to know what they mean when they say this. But you should also understand every time you see this kind of use of arbit word arbitrage, you should also remember what CRA is. And you should understand that these are not CRA. Okay. So uncovered interest rate, interest arbitrage and foreign exchange by, uh, in this in foreign exchange is called a carry trade okay so this was called a carry trade when people were buying Aussie because uh, when they were borrowing in yen and putting it on Aussie dollar deposit okay and earning the higher interest rates in Aussie whenever you do this kind of an interest rate play this is called in a foreign exchange market is called a carry trade so if you hear this exp expression what is a carry trade this is basically what it means carry means you're getting the interest carry so that differential of two percent that is referred to as the carry so you can say I've got a carry of two percent okay but then that carry will not uh, help you much if there is a massive move in the foreign exchange rate then you're in big trouble okay so this is what happened to a lot of uh, investors in the foreign exchange markets when the massive move happened they ended up with huge losses okay so this again is the proof that because the foreign exchange risk is not covered so it's not really CRA you still have some market risk on the transaction when you're doing this uncovered interest so-called uncovered interest arbitrage so the use of the word arbitrage here is again not proper okay the third example i'll give you which you should know is three examples of uh, this the third example is what is called volatility arbitrage okay also not uh, proper use of the word arbitrage volatility arbitrage what is this i've already described this to you if you remember when we talked about, uh, I don't know if this thing will open here. Where is our, did we have eyeball? Yeah, I, I think, was it this one? <coughs> yeah. You remember when we discussed this topic, slightly advanced topic in uh, in uh, op in uh, options and ball, we uh, talked about the third meaning of eyeball. I mean, the second intuitive meaning of eyeball, yes. and we said that eyeball is basically the market's forecast of what the age fall reading is going to be in the future. Okay, if you jump into the future, like this is 30-day eyeball for eyeball for 30-day options. That's actually the market's forecast of what will happen to the what will be the age fall reading if you jump forward 30 days and then take the 30-day age fall, then calculate the 30-day age fall. Okay, so the market is predicting the age fall through the eyeball. <coughs> yes. So now what option traders do and I also told you what market makers do in options okay which we which you have not uh, covered that kind of activity what market makers do is essentially they look at the eyeball okay here of course both are very very uh, close together okay but you can see what market makers essentially do is they look at the eyeball that is there in market option prices and they take a view on what will happen to H fall okay so in this case H fall is the blue line 
okay you can see blue, blue, yeah so h1 is a blue line suppose this mark says this market maker and options okay microsoft option takes a view now the what is the eyeball is around 15 percent okay now this guy may take the view that next 30 days something big is going to happen and microsoft uh h wall over the next 30 days is actually going to average about 25 percent okay when you take the h wall reading after 30 days it's actually going to be 25 percent this market maker can take the view that's what option market makers do they take a view on how the h wall is going to evolve okay and of course eyeball you don't have to you can take a view on eyeball also but the current eyeball because what you're going to compare is the current eyeball level versus the your view on how the edge fall is going to pan out in the future okay so the current eyeball level you don't need to take a view you can see it in the market in option prices you can see the current eyeball level so he's going to compare the current eyeball level from the market prices of options and against his own view of how the h fall is going to pan out okay so if he feels that the next uh, i mean the h fall for this relevant period is actually going to end up being 25 percent and the current option market is predicting to be only it predicting it to be only 15 percent right through the eyeballs so the market is underpricing the risk right so he will take a view that the market is under so what he'll do is he'll buy the options he will buy options both calls and puts okay so he'll do transactions like straddles and strangles which is basically uh you buy both calls and puts so he will go long i he will basically go what he's going to do is he's going to go long the options okay and then he will hedge himself dynamically in the market okay using the delta of the options and all that i don't want to go into the detail of that but the point is here this is what is referred to as volatility arbitrage when you hear this term this is what it refers to that that market makers and options will take a view on uh, future h fall okay compare it to current eyeball okay so we'll just write it here that option mm okay option mms take a view on future evolution of h wall okay you have understood that the third meaning of the second intuitive meaning of eyeball which is already there in your notes because the eyeball is a forecast of how the h wall will pan out so the market the market maker is actually saying well i've got my own view of how the h wall is going to pan out okay so he's saying that okay there are two things here now you see once again the same thing we are both talking about how the future rate fall is going to pan out okay one view on that comes from the eyeballs of the current market prices because the current eyeball is a forecast of how the future age fall will pan out okay so the current option market eyeballs are speaking about that topic but another person is speaking about that topic and that is the market maker he's got his own view and his view doesn't match the market's view the market is saying it'll be 15 percent but he thinks it'll be 25 percent so in this case according to him the market price option market is underpricing the risk of balls in this case what he will do so it's basically like once again you can see the same framework according to him the fair value of the eyeball should have been 25 percent but the actual market price is 15 percent so what is he going to do buy or sell he's going to buy the market he'll buy the options and then of course in order to make maintain uh, something near to a, a riskless portfolio but it's actually not riskless but what he'll have to do is basically we have not discussed this in detail but uh, essentially what he will have to do is he'll have to look at the delta of the option and he will have to keep himself uh, he will continuously look at the delta and balance his position in the underlying okay and he will manage the option risk he will manage the risk of all these uh, risks all these uh, different dynamics of the aspects of the option portfolio risk okay which we are not we are not going to the going, going to the details of that but the main point here is that but once again he is not guaranteed to make a profit because this thing is after all is just a view okay he is not so his profit is not locked in until the end of the 30 day period if these are 30 day options whatever his view is we, even if he is right his profits will not be fully realized until he has actually completed that period so he has to hold the options and he has to continuously rebalance his underlying position hedges sometimes he may have to buy options as well okay but uh, mainly vol arbitrage relates to the move in the underlying which will create the h fall reading okay so this is again so you get a flavor of what he's trying to do right he's taking a view on how the h fall will revolve 
evolve and he's comparing it to the market option prices which is also a statement about how the h4 will revolve and there's a dis divergence between the two so that he's trying to do this arbitrage which we incorrect incorrectly call an arbitrage once again it's incorrect to use arbitrage here because the, it is not free of market risk because remember this is just a forecast anytime you have a forecast Anytime any of your calculations in the fair in compute computing the fair value and the market price anytime there's a uh, Forecast involved because this fair value is according to him the fair value of the eyeball should have been 25% uh, because that's what he thinks it will be but that's just his thought so it is no different from somebody coming up with a it's no different from in this kind of a situation when you have a very high NPV for a project because your view is that the returns from the project will be very high. That's just a view. There's no guarantee that that is going to happen. Okay. So therefore, it is therefore is not free of market risk. Okay. So that's why uh, this this activity. That's why this activity which I've just described. You have some flavor of it. You understand something broadly you may not understand the hedging of dynamic delta hedging and all that but the point is that he will continuously hedge himself against a long option position by adjusting his underlying position hedges for this kind of what is called vol arbitrage so this again another use of the term are very commonly used in the industry this refers to this kind of activity once again improper use of the word arbitrage because it is not CRA because it is not free of market risk because you will be whether or not you will make money okay the real problem here is market risk is not removed because whether or not you'll make money or lose money that you may end up losing money that will only become apparent at the end of the 30-day period if you're dealing with a 30-day option okay that becomes the whole thing the results become apparent only at the end of the op option expiration are you following that's why it's not free of market risk okay when you saw classical riskless arbitrage in operation did you have to wait for any end of period here you don't have to wait instantaneously everything is locked in there is no uncertainty are you following here we don't have to wait for the end of 15 days or something like that to see the market risk is locked in right now okay and the profit is so this is what is classical riskless arbitrage and these are some we've discussed three transactions you've got some flavor of the transactions also so that is also some contextual knowledge but you should understand that everyone understood you guys here you're looking kind of like there's a dark cloud or something over here yeah so these are three transactions which are quite common so you should know about the transactions also and these are all examples of improper use of the word arbitrage because it is being used to describe situations which are not CRA that is market risk is not removed instantaneously to zero and profits are not locked in okay is this clear to everyone yeah. okay here also profits are not locked in because you will never know you will never know whether you actually may you may end up losing money okay because if the actual age fall keeps on dropping and your view of 25 percent is just sitting there you'll end up losing money okay so therefore uh, so so therefore this, these are all examples of improper use of the word arbitrage so we have learned some important terms we have understood the fundamental approach in, uh, in AFV true AFV is always think of synthetic equivalent okay and then it involves obviously classical riskless arbitrage you have understood the classic uh, the important as aspect of that it is riskless no remaining market risk okay and then you understood three transactions which are um, this class is 1245 okay so then you have understood three transactions which are uh, free uh, which are improper which are examples of improper uses of the word arbitrage okay so this this much we have covered okay now let's understand uh, something else which since so why did we come to this we came to this because now again you might be wondering why we were doing futures why we got into this because we had uh, we had gone into futures then we encountered this topic called convergence of futures and spot remember this topic yeah convergence of the futures price to the uh, let's try and get this all right so we were looking at this topic so why did i get into the entire discussion about arbitrage okay and then we had to get into arbitrage and since we got into that i thought i would explain what afv is as well okay and why i have made this distinction here now you understand why i have made the distinction that afv approaches are fundamentally different from the forecast based valuation approaches because in this kind of in this when you're in this box you don't think about do you think about synthetic equivalence 
you don't think about synthetic equivalence so that is a fundamental difference and of course when you have true AFV this is subjective still but when you have true AFV it's not subjective it's completely objective because you can as long as you can actually execute the arbitrage and lock in the profit in this case this is guaranteed to make the price converge to the fair value as you saw in this example with no restrictions on the movement of sugar it is guaranteed that the prices will have to converge okay so this is what is sometimes called uh, I can write it here itself that this is sometimes you might hear this in economics also it's called the law of one price that the same asset cannot have two different prices okay so this is obviously but this is not sufficiently uh, illustrative it has to be dilated upon with all the discussions that we have had that you have to be able to execute the arbitrage if you can't execute the arbitrage then of course the prices will remain out of line okay so the law of one price only works when you are able to execute class CRA okay so there should be a synthetic equivalent and you should be able to execute the arbitrage only then will the law of one price work and the prices be forced to converge yes okay all right so um, the other important point I have to explain is why have I put this here so now you understand why these are different approaches but now one more thing I have to explain is why have I said that all option valuation models are under AFV but they are improperly so called okay that is it's a very fancy English uh, expression taken from John Austin but basically this is uh, not proper AFV and this is true AFV what you just saw in the case of the sugar arbitrage trade okay so let me explain why the option markets are why option valuation models are not example of what is this now we have to cut marks for uh, Bharat and uh, Ganotra so we have to now we have to become more strict uh, where is this today this is session outline okay all right so let's um, go back to this okay so everything here has been uh, so one more thing I wanted to explain is why option models okay this we can do later okay so the other important points is why are I will just copy it from here this is the point I'm trying to explain now why are all option valuation models so of AFV improperly so called I'm just trying to okay so why is that anybody has any idea you should now be able to since you have learned so many things by now you should be able to already give me an answer so a so AFV improperly so called or let's just say improper AFV okay uh, why is it improper AFV for in the case of option valuation models now that you know what proper AFV is proper AFV you see an example here okay and all these are we uh, maybe hopefully later on we'll find so give you an example FX cross rates okay so you have seen some examples here that the simplest example that we showed you this is true AFV okay because everything is subjective <coughs> so now tell me <coughs> why is an option valuation model first what happened here bar chart is blocked also oh, when I load it even though I loaded it uh, in my office but when I come down here it's blocked okay um, all right so why is it now okay now this is the reason I uh, let me just explain the first part why is it an AFP and why is it improper okay why is it an AFP so I put it here all option valuation models I've put under this I've not put them with this okay all option valuation models are put under AFP because these all the option valuation no matter what model you look at they will all use the technique of synthetic equivalence okay so the way these option models are all constructed okay black shows whatever you want to look at Garmin Colhagen all of them assume that they, they are going to come up with a synthetic equivalent of the option okay which is what this guy also does when you're doing wall arbitrage you're essentially trying to uh, create a synthetic equivalent of the option continuously rebalancing the the delta equivalent of the hedge okay so but anyway so these guys assume so the reason I put it in AFP is because all option models 
will use this AFP valuation technique which means they will look at the they will say what is the fair price of a call option okay they'll say well the fair price of a call option is whatever it costs to create the synthetic equivalent okay and then they will proceed to use that technique to value the option okay to come up with a fair value so that is why I have put uh, option valuation models under AFV because they are using the AFV technique of using synthetic equivalents. Okay, this is clear. Okay, first part is clear why I put it here. Now, second part, can you tell me why by looking at the model but based on the discussions we have had? Why as I said it's not proper AFV? Yes. Yeah, use give her the mic. We can let's use the mic since we have it. Yeah. Because the input is subjective. Very good, excellent. So this is the right answer here. Wall input is subjective. Okay. So we can't have in any so uh, in any AFP in any case of true AFP. Okay. Uh, in any case of true AFP, we cannot have any input in the model which is subjective. Okay. If you go back to your example here, what is this? One minute. Where are we? <coughs> okay all right guys here any any in the case of true AFV we cannot have any model input to the fair value which is subjective everything has to be objective clearly observable in the marketplace is this clear okay but we have this problem that we have uh, in this option pricing model we have a wall input which is subjective here what we do is the option so what are the option pricing models doing they make I just think I don't know if you're aware of this but they assume they assume that what volatility will happen in the future okay is known so can you can you think about how ridiculous this is it is like saying for me it's like me saying that okay it is like me saying that I know that I will live till the age of 95 okay so first of all nobody will believe anyone who says that and the bigger bigger problem is you have no base you have no basis for making that kind of statement are you following yes. there is no basis for saying that this person will live till the age any any particular person okay in insurance life life insurance underwriting you can say that 75 percent of the population will live till the age of 80 or something like that those are numbers we are making a forecast for large groups of people but for any given individual you can't say that this person will live to 95 or 85 or whatever right there's no basis for making that statement so this is the problem this is why most of these models are quite ridiculous but all option models assume that the wall is known and what is this wall? this is a statement about what will happen in the future what kind of H wall reading is going to prevail if this is a 30-day option okay this really this input what the model is asking for here when it's asking you for this input is asking you to put in what uh, H wall reading will prevail after 30 days okay so how will the asset price move remember the H wall reading is a function of how the asset price moves you saw the calculation right so this is basically an in, a statement about how the H wall will uh, reading will be what the H wall reading will be after 30 days okay and who knows that nobody knows that right it's not even possible to know that okay so this is the problem with these option but all the option valuation models assume that the future volatility is known okay this is why in my opinion these are mostly useless and you'll see that they are not very useful in solving any decision problem any important decision problem whether to buy or sell you still have to take a view underlying asset in eyeballs you have to take a view which means you're taking a risk okay so none of these so this is an example so the reason I put it under uh, AFV is because they use AFV techniques okay they use AFV techniques because they work with a synthetic equivalent okay and the way they are the reason they are able to come up with the price the reason they are able to come up with this price by using a synthetic equivalent concept okay they can say that this price should be 3.01 and according to them this is an AFV price okay this is an AFV this, this price is equal to the AFV fair value but it is critically dependent on the assumption that the future fall is known okay so then this you have to understand about all option models they assume that the future wall is known okay and that's how they come up with this so now you understand why I have put it here and why I have said improper now you understand why why have we put in 
maybe Gulati can maybe Gulati gets up but stop then he'll wake up because he's sleeping anyway so he gets up then maybe he'll wake up okay all right uh, is this clear to everybody now why have I put now you have understood you have seen that option valuation mod in your study of models option valuation models are one type of model and where do we put them we don't put it under forecast based valuation but although you can see there's a forecast involved but I have chosen to put it under AFV because they are using AFV techniques they are using uh, synthetic equivalent principles so the valuation principle is AFV based uh, based uh, AFV type of approach to valuation so that's why I put it here but it's improper improper AFV improper to call it AFV because it is not 100% lockdown valuation it is uh, there are subjective elements in the inputs so the output that you get is not a this thing is not an arbitrage free value this call option fair value is not an arbitrage free value because remember what arbitrage free valuation is arbitrage if this were actually arbitrage free it would mean that if the uh, call option price market price is set equal to this there would be no opportunities for arbitrage okay now may not be opportunity for arbitrage but they're actually the point is that therefore the price must always converge to this you understand if we say the because arbitrage free valuation if you say that something is an arbitrage free value uh, this this fair value is an arbitrage free fair value okay that means that if the market price is equal to this fair value there is no opportunity for making a riskless profit okay but here you can't say that and therefore the market price has to converge to this that is a stronger statement that you're making are you following yes, sir. in any such situation where you can do the arbitrage the market price must come to the fair value very quickly because people will otherwise be earning risk-free profits so the market price has to come to the fair value okay but in option markets that does not happen are you following yes, sir. okay and as you saw yourself what happens in option markets it's actually a cop-out okay if you see what the option market is doing the option market is actually let me explain this full thing here uh, to understand that the option market is actually a cop-out because what did you why do we have the concept of eyeball <coughs> You see how ridiculous these models are okay so first we assume that we know the future ball and then we can say well if we know the future ball it's like my saying that you know okay can you predict when mr x will die i will say that okay i will assume that i know when he gets a severe case of terminal cancer and then i'll be able to pre predict when he's going to die okay because then you, maybe you can just predict within one year the person will be gone okay so this is like assuming that i know the future ball so then i can predict the fair value of the option so it's quite ridiculous and now you see what actually happens in the real world what happens in the real world is let's say somebody is doing a fair value let's say Piyush is doing a fair value of this option and according to him the future value of the uh, the future H wall is going to turn out to be 25% okay but he looks at so therefore he comes out with a fair value of 3.019 but he looks into the market and he sees that oh actually this option price is trading at 7.3 so and there is no way to for anybody to necessarily make the 7.3 converge to 3.02 are you following because any if you want to do that you can't do it in a riskless fashion you'll have to take some risk okay if you want to sell those options and push down the eyeball okay but you'll have to take some risk so this is not a cra arbitrage true arbitrage free valuation this is clear so the market price frequently diverges so what do we actually end up doing in real life when you look at option trading software what are they giving you you mouse over and they're giving you the eyeball so they actually trade telling you that okay this one has an eyeball too. so you actually are again once again looking from looking at the market and putting it into the model so the model is actually not useful okay so the only types of real arbitrage free valuation models which are useful are what i have shown you here we haven't discussed any of them fx forwards okay uh, fx cross rates there are many other examples put call parity is another example where i can uh, put this down we haven't had time to discuss put call parity but this is an example of true afv because if it if it deviates remember true afv is only in cases where if the market price deviates from the fair value if the market price deviates from the fair value people will be able to earn instantaneous risk-free profits by doing cra and very soon the market price will have to converge to the fair value okay no such thing is happening in the case of options in fact what we are doing is we are surrendering to the market see you see this is a sort of surrender to the market 
what are we doing we are taking the market price and we are asking ourselves what what should the wall input be to produce this market price yes to get the eyeball what should be the wall input be to produce this market price so we are actually surrendering to the market price and taking the data from the market and then putting it in the model and talking about the eyeball and still people are essentially you have to take a view on the eyeball right so this so you now have an understanding of option models from a theoretical perspective has everyone understood okay some important concepts we have covered okay so let's go back to this what else do we have to do I think most of this covered. Why are all option valuation models examples of AFV improperly so called? Okay, now you have understood this. Okay, um, all right, maybe I'll put in some extra writing later on in this, but you, have, you should have understood the concept here. Okay, because basically you can't make the prices converged, you can't make the price converge to the model fair value. This we can basically, uh, no way to ensure. Uh, through CRA that uh, market price will converge to, to fair value okay fair value determined using AFE principles okay so this is how we can use the language so we say we are using AFP principles which is basically automatically means thinking about synthetic equivalence and the cost of generating the fixed synthetic equivalent is the fair value okay to fair value using AFC is this clear now okay now we are done with all this stuff okay I've just given you some uh, quotes on models etc you can read all this okay so you'll see that people who are actually practitioners even if even if you listen to uh, this guy uh, what's his double line capital? Uh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, Jim Gunlack, Jeffrey Gunlack. If you listen to him also, uh, he's quite skilled in mathematics, but he also doesn't have that much faith in models. So if you look at practitioners, you'll see that you look at Bob Buffett. I'll give you some other links also. You, these are all YouTube videos. Uh, you'll think you'll see that but people like Buffett are quite skeptical about the value of models. Okay, they they use them in the sense they use it as a framework, but they see that there is not much. You can't really rely on it much okay that it gives you a false sense of so this quote from Howard Marks is actually brilliant this uh, Howard Marks I've told you guys to read the memos okay I've given you the link also all you guys mr. credit analyst where's he gone he's gone out everybody's out <laughs> credit analyst Chuk. Okay. okay somebody else is also out anyway doesn't matter okay so very important because Howard Marks is a credit investor so you can learn a lot by uh, reading his memos okay for you guys you're just coming into the market you can learn a lot by reading his memos there are lots of Howard Marks videos also on the internet okay on YouTube you can see them so you can listen to his lectures so this quote I find brilliant actually it's a brilliant insight into human nature and he says as you can you understand what this means that part of the reasons why part of the reason why uh, uh, people like uh, to hang their hat on models is because people most people rather be precisely wrong than approximately right so the model is very precise okay so people would rather be precisely wrong than approximately right so this is not my statement so you'll notice that the kind of flavor I've given you is shared by many practitioners okay if you listen to Buffett and uh, Howard Marks Jeffrey Gunlack many of these people you'll find the same kind of uh, views on uh, on the use of models and things like that so you should know theoretically how they're constructed okay and so Buffett also many of these discussions in the uh, annual general meetings of Berkshire you can see them on YouTube you can see the questions being asked or etc okay so with this covers us for this topic now we go back to our futures now we have to cover this point which where we got stuck where we got distracted into this entire destruction about AFV and CRA and all that why did we have to go there because we had where is Kushbu she is fallen asleep she's not well so if you're not well you go home if you're not well you should go home you're not looking well also so I mean so what do you want to do you have a class okay so that's your call then as far as I'm concerned you can go home okay because we got into the detailed discussion because you said you were not able to follow the first uh, statement about the convergence of futures to spot okay so that's why we went to the long discussion yeah okay 
Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. If you don't have to strain yourself. You can relax. You can go home. Whatever you want to do. Okay. But the point is that why did we go to the discussion about AFV and CRA and all that? Because to understand this convergence, to understand this convergence, we had to understand those concepts. Okay. It helps us to understand this con uh, convergence better once we have understood CRA and we have understood AFV and all those things. And since I went into that, I wanted to give the discussion about. I wanted to give the explanation about the taxonomy that I've given you guys. Okay. All right. So now, now that you're armed with the knowledge of CRA and all that, now can you understand this? Read this a little bit. Can you read this and understand? First, we suppose that the futures is above the spot. Okay. And see what he has written. See if you can understand what is being said here. Look here, Adash. Don't look at uh, Ritesh's book. Look here. <laughs> Try to understand, armed with your knowledge of CRA. Because here you have to remember the concept again of the synthetic equivalent. So, if you take one, the futures price can be taken as a synthetic equivalent of the spot, of the physical commodity. Or you can take the physical commodity as the synthetic equivalent of the future, futures price. Because they are the price of the same thing. Because you can deliver that physical commodity against the futures contract. So therefore, they are, they are. you can see clearly that they are synthetic equivalents. That instead of physically buying this commodity in the market, I can buy the futures contract and wait till I get delivery not square my position and wait till get till I get delivered. So that will end up with the same outcome that the physical commodity will end up in my lap. Yes. Right. So they are synthetic equivalents. Can you see that? Are you able to see that concept that they are basically the same thing? Okay. Yes. Not very convincing. So therefore, yes, we are convinced. Okay. So that's why. So what do you do? Then they have a clear arbitrage because you have, uh, if you have two synthetic, if you have a synthetic equivalent and you have another asset and it's synthetic equivalent. Okay. If the two of them are not at the same price, then there's an opportunity for CRA. Okay. That's what they're saying here. Okay. So then in this case, if you see that the futures is above the spot during the close to the delivery period. Okay. Then in that case, they are basically uh, the same thing which to one commodity having two different prices okay one asset having two different prices so in this case because you can perform the arbitrage so the law of one price has to prevail so therefore you will sell you'll again go back to your same framework the fair value versus market price comparison so you see that the market price of the futures contract is some price let's say 100 but you see that the price of the synthetic equivalent is 85 so in this case then then the futures contract is over overpriced relative to its fair value because it is it should be trading at 85 not at 100 so in this case you will sell the market price okay which is over, over overpriced and then you'll buy the synthetic equivalent so that you don't have a net position because if you sell something and you buy its synthetic equivalent then you don't have a net position because you're actually square because you have bought the synthetic equivalent and you have sold the asset similarly or you may have sold the asset and bought the synthetic equivalent either way you don't have a net position because the two are the same right so that's what you're doing here is this clear the first step yes Krishti, you're not looking convinced is this clear the first first step is clear okay so now you understand so this will make because these are synthetic equivalents in a situation where you can actually make the cra happen okay so therefore this will force now you understand why there has to be convergence because if there is a situation where you can actually make the arbitrage happen right you can make the arbitrage happen and uh, you have actually uh, therefore you can make the CRA happen and you have uh, a particular asset and it's uh, uh, synthetic equivalent trading at two different prices that cannot be sustained the prices will have to converge is that clear to everyone yes, yeah so now you understand why this convergence has to happen using the concept of the synthetic equivalent and the concept of CRA and the forced convergence. The CRA will force the prices to converge because the law of one price must prevail given the circumstances. The fact that you can actually execute the arbitrage. Is this clear? Okay. So the first part is clear. 
the second part is the other part which we you can read it on your own but now it's the same logic should be obvious in case the futures is below the spot okay once again you will see that the fair value of the market price is below the fair value okay so in this case you'll buy the market okay again the fra will force the two prices to converge in any case you can basically lock in the profit by just waiting to get your uh, you get waiting to get delivered is this clear okay two synthetic uh, two uh, any asset and a synthetic equivalent uh, trading at two different prices okay will offer an opportunity for CRA unless there's any kind of block on executing the arbitrage you also have to see the situation on the ground okay as we said if the NDMC has put up barriers preventing the movement of sugar from south to north Delhi then the prices will not necessarily converge because there's nothing to force the prices to come together because people are not able to execute the arbitrage you can't buy in Delhi because you, you can't buy in South Delhi because you have to move the sugar to North Delhi to make delivery. Are you following? Right? So anytime in any situation where you see, although theoretically there is a synthetic equivalent, but you can't execute the CRA for whatever reason, maybe capital controls, okay, this and that, okay. So like Indian gold prices, local gold prices in rupees and world gold prices, theoretically there's a synthetic equivalent, okay. But when you execute the, when you compute the fair value, you'll find that the fair value is about, about 15%, 10, 15% below the local Indian market price, okay. But that's because of import duties and this, this, all this kinds of stuff. And there's no free movement of capital. So you can't actually make the prices converge because you can't freely buy and sell gold and move capital in and out of India. Okay, so that's so that's an example where theoretically you have the synthetic equivalent. Yes, you can see it. You have the dollar rupee price. You have the international gold price in dollars. Okay, you can convert troy ounces to grams. You can see the local Indian price, but you can't execute the arbitrage. So there is no force that is forcing the prices to converge. That's why the Indian gold prices can remain out of line with the world gold prices because the CRA is not allowed to be executed. So they're not forcing the prices to converge. Is this clear? Okay. Yes. So that covers this uh, topic. Okay. So now we go into the operation of margin accounts. Okay. You can read this on your own, but you have to understand we have already discussed this daily settlements okay so in every futures contract there will be something called initial margin you can read these i'm not going to uh, write any notes here at this stage you can see what initial margin is you guys understand what initial margin is you can see it here in the book i think we have a little bit in your notes about uh, where are your futures notes i actually did not may not have opened your futures notes so these are futures on finviz okay one minute let me just go into um We'll see if I have. So, does everybody understand what initial margin is? Yes, Sukriti. What is initial margin? You don't know. Why are you sitting quietly then? What have we discussed that we have to put up some money in order to trade on an exchange? Now we're talking about ETM. Okay. So, to trade with the ETM, to trade on ETM, you have to put up some money. So that's your initial margin. Okay. So go back and read all the stuff. Okay. Let's uh, look at. Let's make full use of the time, with Garvit's permission. Okay. <laughs> Japanese management. Sulbi has failed. Japanese management. Okay. Okay. Where are the talk about margins? Okay. You can see here. There's a CME group link. What else do I have for you guys on margins? Nothing much. So the rest of the margins material basically comes from the book. Okay. You read these chapters here. Okay. But the only thing I've given you here is the CME performance bonds. Okay. Look at this. What do they say here? So there are two types of margins. Okay. As you will see here, there's initial margin and then there's maintenance margin. Okay. So you start with initial margin is what you have to put up to put on the trade. If you don't put up initial margin, you can't do the trade. You can't do any trade on an ATM without putting up initial margin. And remember that chain that we showed you from TIC to IB to clearing member to the exchange clearing house. Remember that chain? So the margin will move all the way up down the chain. And when you get paid for your daily profits, your the daily profit will come back up the chain all the way to the TIC. Yes, remember that? Okay. So that's how the margin flows are happening. So you have to put up initial margin, otherwise they won't let you do the trade. 
so the initial margin and every day you have if you lose money so the market will it will compute here have they given some example yeah they've given an example here you can look at this okay all right so let's say the margin is six thousand dollars per contract okay so you buy two contracts you have to put up twelve thousand dollars okay and say uh, the you have bought let's say the i think he's assuming here that you bought it at 1250 per ounce okay and then the price has dropped to 1241 okay so the trader has a loss of this much okay each contract is, is anyone able to follow the calculation here each contract is for 100 ounces the Comex Gold contract, which is part of the CMA group now, okay, uh, that the gold contract, everything has a contract size associated. It could have been thousand ounces. They have chosen to make it 100 ounces. Could have been 50 ounces. They have made it 100 ounces. That's just a choice, okay. The contract size is 100 100 ounces. Remember, on exchange trade ETM, everything will have a contract size. The oil contract is a thousand barrels. You can't say I want to go and deal in 695 barrels. Not allowed. Okay, thousand barrels lots round multiples of thousand barrels so here the gold contract is a hundred ounces so you buy two contracts that means you're about 200 ounces the price is per ounce actually it's troy ounce they should have written troy ounce because ounce has a different meaning okay ounce is different from troy ounce so they actually they should have written troy ounce yeah that ounce in baking is not the same as troy ounce the international gold price trades in troy ounces okay you can look it up on google what is the conversion okay but the point is this is a price per unit okay the unit is one troy ounce price per unit so you bought 200 units and you have lost from 1250 to 41 you lost nine dollars per unit is everyone following yes, you lost nine dollars per unit yes. so you lost eighteen hundred dollars yes 200 units so that eighteen hundred dollars by next morning you have to pay it we have already discussed this yes, okay you have to pay it up in the way next morning okay if you don't pay up what the exchange will do we already discussed all this the ech will uh, close out your position yes. and whatever loss is incurred in closing your position they will forfeit your initial margin deposit okay and use it to fund that loss so the exchange is not really in trouble okay so here you find out uh, you here you find out here what, where have i given the uh, this thing here here what does it say here on the cme so any exchange that you trade at actually the initial margin requirements one is that the exchange will set initial margin requirements and maintenance margin okay maintenance is what you have to maintain so suppose you put up six thousand dollars initially for each contract and gold maybe the maintenance margin is just to give an example maybe it's five hundred dollars uh, five thousand dollars so the moment you experience thousand dollars of losses okay you will have to top up because the maintenance margin is set at five thousand you can read this in the notes okay it's well explained in the textbook okay how it works but there's a second concept called maintenance margin also written in the textbook okay so here what will happen is the initial margin and the moment you hit the maintenance margin because you're losing money the exchange will ask you to top up go back to im levels you have to send the money again to top up to im levels okay this is clear okay, all right so one minute where will you find its initial margin here what does it say you're going to be looking at speculative margins although you're doing a hedging project a hundred initial margin requirements a hundred percent hundred ten percent of the maintenance margin requirement okay so later on we'll have to find out what the maintenance margin requirement is yes, in this example they have given you uh, that the maintenance margin requirement is uh, this 1400 here yes. and so the speculative uh, initial margin is 110 percent of 1400 which is 1540 yes. so you have to figure out for every contract one minute for every contract contract you have to figure out im and F, uh, im and mm okay so please remember to finish one let's see what is left in this future then we finish the future segment i want to move on to the case which is your project one minute not now not now not now all this one minute it's just 45 please read all this stuff okay finish the future readings finish the future readings on your own all right okay you thought i was going to cover the next topic also now no. I, I'm, I'm cruel but i'm not that cruel <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, certainly not. You want to go out again? No, no, sir. This is not. Uh, I, have, I have to ask something, but not from the syllabus. From where? Sir, it is about the classes that you are changing that. Uh, okay, it's an administrative question. Yes, sir. It's not a technical question. Anybody has a technical question? Okay, let's pause.